you so much, Chair. Um, before I start um, my presentation, I would like to thank the Academy of the Vatican for this invitation. It's a real privilege to be among great scientists across the world to talk about great things, climate change, from various perspectives, morality, ethics, philosophy, to hardcore science, uh, buildings, and, and IT. Um, I'm coming with a humble background of being born in the Sahel and growing in that context to reflect on issues that matters to people. Um, it's about climate change, which is an impediment for many development issues um, in the region. So I decided to see how we can use um, the conduit we are, we are offered today to reflect on possibility of debriding adaptation action in dry land, basing our presentation on positive rhetorics rather than negative you know, uh, images, which has been protracted in the Sahel for many years. In, if I can get the slide mover thing to move myself around. Thank you, my sister. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I think Alicia will remember this map we use in the special report on climate change and land, where aridity was one of the uh, you know hot spots of all the climate change issues that we are talking about. And, and by the way, this presentation would be kind of zoom of many of the things we have heard uh, earlier. The zoom on the water issues Aditi was mentioning, the zoom on the agroforestry, the zoom on the food system that Alicia was speaking, the zoom of the institutional dimensions in Africa and how we handle. And this is a situation where every part of this arid land has gone several, not one shock, but several climate change um, shocks from hot nights, heat waves, um, deaths related to heat, undernutrition, water availability, to you know evapotranspiration and, and degradation of biodiversity. All those things that comes in piecemeal in different contexts are you know concentrated into the, the dry land. But let me just bring this slide which shows the evolution of rainfall, particularly in the Sahel. Um, and let's focus on the last 40 years, how the climate has evolved. We have a mixed feeling, whereas the whole rainfall is increasing in terms of total annual rain, that leads to what to call the greening of the Sahel. What we have is a high variability of the rainy season. And whatever climate forecast we have, globally on that region. Climate variability is the most difficult thing to prevent, to, 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 to I mean, to, to project. Um, one example, just before I leave the country, uh, you know, it starts raining in June, but we, we wait for one month be before the next rain comes in. Those long dry spells are absolutely crucial in addressing climate change, but the impact are there. Death of livestock in the 70s, mega drought that leads to famine, as Alicia mentioned, in West Africa. Drought in, in, in selective countries. In East Africa, it's the same, uh, as Joyce mentioned. And recently, a lot of flooding happening now in Cote d'Ivoire, in Senegal, in all those countries. When rivers are the place for intensive agricultural production, and when those rivers are subjected to flooded, flooding every year, the possibility to catch up with the yield gap every year is just being reduced by high climate variability. And these are issues that we don't talk enough. And here's the context of a farmer in, in West Africa, basically. 90% of the farmers, they basically are like this one. Very low investment in terms of rural equipment. Land degradation, they don't have any fertilizers. A big yield gap. The future of food security, people, the young generation have no future, and then we are, we are questioning the, the migrations across the Sahara in the waters to come to Europe. 
But if, you, if, if the only message that comes to the young generation is just there is no food production, there is no future for them, then they, they, they have to prepare themselves for, for migration and poverty and famine. And the good news is, as Asta said, in the background you see some trees, and the tree you see there is Cordilla. And look at the productivity under Cordilla Pinatown. It's like Federbia, it's a, it's a fabasi, it's high yield. So how can we promote all the type of traditional practices rather than the, the imported colonial system, which is monocropping, that people try still to use for commodity export? But in the background of this Green Revolution sort of approach for agriculture, there is also this background traditional secular activities of agroforestry, as uh, my colleague Asta mentioned, that could be promoted. But this is the situation. In, in fact, despite those bad news, the Sahelian regions are a remarkable place of resource endowment that can really accelerate the transformation, the deep and rapid transformation we want. It's full of resources. It's full of potential at all sense. Natural resource potential, social capital potential, human resource potential, and the like. Everything you need to create deep transformation exists. But now that we need institutions to, to really create that momentum. And the, what I'm going to talk about is the process that leads to stronger institutions. But let me focus first on, on that potential we're talking about. I still quickly brushed in um, the importance of agroforestry. Let me open it up and we get it wide to perennial crops. Crops that can grow all the year round, crops that can be, give yield of different kind of fruits, of vegetables all the year round, but which are neglected, um, we call it neglected plant. So that brings us to think on the nexus between food security, climate change, health, rural livelihood, and health you know, comes back to diet. It's not only about meat consumption and non-meat consumption. It's about the diversity of food product that you have locally that you can tap in, which is very highly nutritious. What we did not talk enough about is the need of vitamin and protein can be satisfied totally by local product, which we have in the, in the, in the dry land. But we need to do some effort on science, particularly the domestication. The reason why we, we mentioned domestication here is that if you don't do it for the sake of local communities, the multinational will do it by themselves. I don't want to use names, but you know it. Nestle, Unilever, Coca-Cola. They will patent those products, and they will export it back the same way they did with coffee and cocoa, which is locally produced in Africa, but the real high value of those products goes to multinational. How can we inverse the rhetoric here by building you know, the, the intellectual property, which is related to the use of those products for community to, to, to take advantage of the neglected and underutilized species, uh, which has multiple benefits? So the major gap we need to address, indeed, is agronomic properties, the distribution, use, or use the uses and impact, and the transformation, that uh, product, the transformative, transform, transform product that can come from that. Here we have some fonio, some baobab, and some what you call bambara bean. And again, when those names come out at international uh, literature, it comes with stigma. Called bambara beans, um, the, 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 the bread of the monkey, the orange uh, of the wild. It's never the native name, which is attractive and sexy, excuse me the expression, that is being used. Um, baobab is an Arab word which see, means the fruits with many, many. But the, when the French came, they call it the bread of the monkey. And how can you just give a value of a product where the stigma on the name is just really limiting its attractivity uh, for the international market? So, in details, what you could see in those products is high protein content. Um, you know, uh, in the nutrition, you focus on the on the on, on the pie, which is on the right, uh, and the basic starch intent, the carbon hydrates, which has, which is in it, the protein and oil, which are on there. A different set of product will yield this kind of potential. And we have balanites. That's one you show you show in in Ethiopia. We have strychnospinosa. We have deuterium microcarbon. We have listed in my institute 120 plants which are in any of the national agricultural policies. 
the agricultural policies in Africa reflect what FAO is saying about the five dominant crops as a way to reflect food, food security, wheat, maize, and those things. But Africa has more than 100 species that can be domesticated, that can be grown, and that can help improve nutrition. And bes beside those uh, potential, um, the, the, the neglected opportunity in terms of tourism, of cultural tourism, of nutrition, de nutritious delicacy, uh, it's not only plants, but also animal delicacies. The Great Green Wall, as mentioned by my, pre my previ the previous speakers, as a way to attract more investment into land restoration. The small scale irrigation, editing, uh, which is important, and I will give you some evidence why it's so important to focus on small scale irrigation, simply because Africa, the, the, with the irrigation, the use of water for irrigation is less than 5% of the whole total water. We still depend on rainfall. And the potential of tapping into water resources to accelerate food security is absolutely unprecedented uh, to, uh, to, to, to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of adaptation to climate change. So solar panel and all those things we mentioned earlier. But here is a figure we, we work on. I, I was uh, honored to be part also of the World Atlas of Desertification, a report of European Commission um, uh, by GRC, Joint Research Center in ISPRA here in Italy. And the potential to, to build a yield gap from the Sahelian region is absolutely high. Despite the fact that people think those soils are degraded, the potential of rich soil, you mentioned 60% of the potential for agriculture, arable land, is in Africa. And a great deal of those 60% are in arid land. The potential should be unlocked if you just combine uh, land fertility with water and energy access in order to unlock that potential. And that's the reason why we stop. But if you look from Senegal to almost Ethiopia, the dark, dark green areas is, a, is, is really where the potential of accelerating 100% potential of yield in terms of agriculture is happening. And this is the some reason why it's the case. Um, I call it the no drought, um, uh, para, um, you know, enigma. Um, we Sahel is dry, the dry lands, they don't have water, but if you leave the deep water table, sometimes fossil water table, the potential is mid billions of cubic meter of water. Um, if we can tap in oil, the same technology will help you access this kind of water. Obviously, it's debatable. It's, it's fossil water. But if you combine it with surface water, and we did a model in the, in the, in the furlough of Senegal, that's the driest part of the country, the potential of a small water pond to be managed and to improve water harvesting in those small water ponds to do micro-irrigation is unprecedented. So water, to me, is there. The potential is there. The possibility to access them has not been fully um, uh, re, uh, you know, unleashed. And that is one of the potential which I want to share. The other potential is you know, the local practice that people can do. Somebody mentioned Zai, I think, Ali Sher, who mentioned Zai and this half moons practice. And those are practice are cost effective. Um, you know, we need some machineries. Sometimes we need some local community engagement. But the possibility to increase water infiltration the possibility to retain water, three months of rainfall to feed people for 12 months, requires some creativity on ways that water can be unleashed. Burkina Faso, Senegal, towards Niger, those practices are unknown, but they need to be scaled up. They need to be sustained. Uh, erosion control should be one of the core activities in, in getting uh, fertile soil and reclaiming land. And if you go to the latest global land outlook, which we produce for UNCCD, the latest one for West Africa, those practice has been you know, proposed as, as a good practice. So, so now, coming back to irrigation, uh, Chair, um, uh, I think we are looking at irrigation as a fancy technological uh, you know, uh, pro, uh, you know, approach. It can be very simple. It can be as simple as gravi gravity options through recycled barrels and the, my favorite is a small water bottle you have near that tree. It's like when you're drinking that medicine, which you call ampoule in French, you know? Uh, if you open the, the, one of the sides, the water will not drop. As you open the top side, the water will power in. It's the same principle we use in recycled water. In hotels, here in the meeting, everywhere, those plastic bottles are being used everywhere for mineral water. 
So what we did in Burkina Faso is to get bigger than this one, the 10 liters, where you make, make a small hole on the bottom and tight, slightly open on the top to get hydrostatic transfer of pressure. So the hole on the bottom will drop water continuously. So what you need to, to do is to fill that bottle of water, the bigger one, every 15 days to make sure that the seedlings will grow over time and, and survive the nine months dry season. And that's the survival uh, effort. You, may, you say tree growing is better than tree planting. That's something I heard he says. And we are putting it in action, how to make tree grows. And you add to that a protection against animal um, you know, uh, eating them, then you would definitely have a restored land for, for a very short while. The rest are, if possible, investment into a combination of agroforestry, the big image, which is Federbia on the background, and, 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 and some cropping uh, on, 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 on the front line. The, the third opportunity is how to manage livestock transhumans movement, um, which creates a lot of conflicts um, between herders and agriculturists. Great set of examples have been known in Kenya. It's coming in West Africa. Recently, many hundreds of people died in, 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 in uh, Darfur, uh, Ibrahim, because of the, 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 the crisis between the herders and, and the agriculture for claiming land and using resources. And how do we improve resource management to reduce those conflicts and optimize adaptation at local level? That's a really important thing. And the same vein, how to manage shifting agriculture, which is still a case in many of the places, some pictures which I take in East Africa on the left side. But by doing that, I come again on what Asta was saying, promoting local native trees. We have been importing trees from Australia, called eucalyptus, sucking our water and destroying the soil, where the native trees are very adapted and they produce wood and, and they produce fruits that people can eat, they're very balanced with the ecology, uh, as uh, the colleague says. So how do we do nature-based solutions, erosion control with locally, uh, you know, sound species that are socially accepted by communities and ecologically adapted to the condition? And the whole potential can be unlocked if a number of other things happen um, to, 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 to tap in renewable water on the market potential, the population is growing, um, the diverse stock potential, the land restoration potential, and the agricultural potential. The institutions that need to deal with those things should have a clear message or clear approach on financial processes, on social mobiliz mobilization and communication. We need to communicate more to our government how these things are important. We need to establish the right partnership. I just repeat what you said earlier, Mr. Chair, and the issue of entrepreneurship, and I pull there. Entrepreneurship the use being involved in creating enterprises on those natural products, those neglected plants and neglected services is a life-saving approach for, 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 for the communities. And a number of recommendations, which I brush very rapidly to be uh, on, on time, uh, to, re to repurpose the rhetoric that the, the image of the Sahel has been a negative image for 50 years. I want people to get the Sahel with the image of positivity. The Sahel is a good place to live in. It has all the potential to, to, to develop, to thrive. It has all the potential to, uh, to, to rise as any prosperous land. It needs to be sustained by uh, national strategies, by public-private finance, by technology innovation, by awareness, and common methods, tools, and standards that can be scaled up. So, and to do that, the process which, which is the second last slide, the process which you are suggesting is to really combine various levels of approaches, um, which is trying to target sector, which is fine, and as far as it's integrated and it's uh, engaging communities to tap into assets. What do we have as assets? All the assets which I mentioned earlier, how to motivate the incentives that goes behind this process and how to deal with external uh, aspect, um, like traditional uh, international trade, uh, you know, uh, globalization, uh, the big financial mechanism that sustain the price of commodity in the market, and the local policy levies, levers, uh, such as land security, local empowerment, and the like. And all those integrated approach will definitely lead to the outcome, which are expecting all of us 
in terms of food security adaptation and resilience. I thank you for your attention.